So once upon a time in black entrepreneur history, there lived a black man in Chicago that founded the first privately and state black owned bank in the north of the USA. His name is Jesse Binga, baby. I mean, I just added the baby Binga, not baby. He was also a real estate mogul. Let's get into it. Now, he became a very controversial figure. But before we get into all the controversy, let's go way back to his mother and his father. His father was a barbershop owner and his mother was a builder. Yep, right in Detroit. He was born in Detroit in the year of 1865. Now, being that his mother was a builder, he learned a whole bunch of stuff about real estate off the top, okay? He assisted his parents in their businesses. Now, what many people don't know is that Jesse Binga's mother, she was responsible for the Binga Rose. The Binga Rose stood in Chicago and it was housing for formerly enslaved people moving up north. Now, not only did his mother build Binga Rose, she was also responsible for the very first consignment of white fish to be sent down to the southern states. She was also responsible for the first shipment of sweet potatoes to, I don't know how to pronounce this, the Gogebic Iron Region of Michigan. So boom, Jesse Binga leaves Detroit after leaving high school and he goes just with $10 in his pocket, baby, to Chicago. Now it was right here in Chicago, he started his own business, all right? He was selling food from the street and he was going door to door too. Now, Pete, this, those same residential areas where he would be selling food, guess what? Later on in the story, he is the one who ended up owning all those properties on that same freaking block. Okay. Don't despise small beginnings. Now, really, really soon after that, he started his own real estate company called JC Binga & Co. Now, this real estate business, he started with barely any money, okay? But as soon as it opened, he started making money immediately. And with the money he made, he ended up leasing a space in what is called the Bates Building. Now, there were already white people running businesses in the Bates Building. So when Jesse Binka got there, they no longer wanted to rent or lease in that building. So they bounced, all right? This did nothing to hurt Binga, of course. Jesse Binga continued to work and earn his money. How did he earn his money? He continued to buy real estate. And not only that, he knew how to renovate them bad boys all on his own with his own two hands. So he would buy the buildings, fix them up from the plumbing to the wallpaper, baby. Now, of course, when he got enough money, he hired people to do the work. Now, after everything's renovated, you know, African-Americans started moving in, right? Of course we did. That meant white flight. White people began to bounce. You have to remember at that time, especially in that time, they bounced quickly because they didn't want the whole black and white living together. That was just the times. OK, that was just what it was. So from where his business was on State Street all the way to Michigan Avenue, that was all black. And in today's dollar, from all the rent money he was collecting each month, it totaled about $84,000 a month today. Da -da. That's when Jesse Binga had an idea. He opened up the first privately owned bank, black owned bank called Binga Bank. Now, according to the Black Dispatch of 1932, Jesse Binga was able to claim more footage on State Street than any other man, black or white, in the city. Now, years down the line, around 1912, he got married to a second wife. He divorced his first one years prior. Her name was Eudora Johnson, if I'm pronouncing that right. Eudora. She was an entrepreneur, but she also inherited $200,000 from her deceased brother, who was a gambling king, known as John Mushmouth Johnson. With that inheritance, their income soared even higher. So in case you don't know, $200,000 is the equivalent of, uh, let's see, you're, uh, about $3 million today. Now, this new wife, she was also the daughter of a salon owner and a property owner, John Johnson. Now, at this point, Jesse Binga and his new wife, they were paying about $700,000 in property taxes a year. That's well over a million dollars. Well over. Well, 
Okay, so here's what the drama is, okay? So they decide they're going to move into an all-white neighborhood. What the flip? Okay, so the white people got angry. Totally. Number one, they didn't want any black people there. Number two, they didn't want any wealthy black people there, okay? That were wealthier than them. So here's when all the rights and stuff start, and you know, like, there was a big right in 1919, okay? But Jesse Binga, white people, would soon say, you're the cause of it, you're the cause of it, because you're making all these freaking black people move over here, and all of y'all have money, and what the flip? So they were angry. So basically, they started bombing his house, yo. They really did, like, six freaking times. Some of the bombs didn't go off, but they also bombed two of his businesses. Anyway, the white people just decided, we're going to just move. We're just going to move out, okay? Okay, so where am I? I don't know. But anyway, he transformed that privately owned Binga Bank to Binga State Bank. All right? And that was in 1921. This was the first state chartered black owned Binga State Bank. Now, for those who don't know about racism, let me explain. It's not about racism that Binga decided he was going to open a black owned bank at all it was because back in those days white people did not want black people banking at their banks so black people had to take it upon themselves to open their own all right jesse bingo was in no way a racist at all but he did believe in helping his race yo when this bank upgraded i'm telling you guess how much money it had black owned dollars it had over a million dollars and that's 17 million dollars today so here's here's a good here's some good news here's some good news here's some good quotes that jesse binga would say learn a business and then mind it save 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 and when you got it then give 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 learn something not so you know about it but that you know it pretty much what you make it and making it big means using every day of it here's one of my favorites Nothing is so easy or wasteful as the work of hating, except hating work. And that goes for all races and all individuals. And here's one last one. I'm going to read it because it's long. You can be a menial or a man of business, but to get out of the menial place requires the thrift that produces property and property enlarges life, work, then not for gain alone, but for the enlarged life that honest gains create. Boop. Here's another thing you might not know about Jesse Binga. He stated that one of the biggest assets he had was this. I quote, The disposition of the average white man to underestimate my knowledge of real estate values. They wouldn't believe that a colored man could take almost any old building and whip it into shape. End quote. Okay, so now here's where things start going downhill. The Great Depression hits. Boom! Everything is in collapse, all right? Including his bank. People couldn't pay him rent. People couldn't pay him anything. So he couldn't pay what he needed to pay to keep his stuff open. His bank foreclosed in 1930. Now, you know these people were coming to get him, right? So he got accused, arrested, and charged with what? Embezzlement. He played innocent the first child. He played guilty the second. Now, his defense stated this during his trial, quote, that under the law, funds to be used for purchase of national bank stock could not be deposited in the state bank. Therefore, no evidence has been presented to show that Binga has embezzled funds. However, despite that end quote, he was still put away, despite them saying that the purpose of the funds that he had was to start a national bank. He served three years. He served three years, but y'all, this is how it was reported in one of the papers that they went and got him out of his home. He was already ill at the time. So by the time he got out of prison, he was in his 70s. He didn't want to be in the public light, but he always wanted to know what people thought of him. And in an interview with the California Eagle of 1938, he's quoted as saying, I was up against problems too big for me. I looked among the men of my race who helped me, but none of them had had as much experience in financial matters as I had. If the task was too big for me, it seemed too big that it would be too big for them. I was willing to relinquish control, but I thought it should be for better, not for worse. Jesse Binga had an extraordinary life. He opened up many doors for African Americans. He passed away in 1950. Through it all, thanks Jesse Binga. That must have been something to see at that time.